I'm speaking into it or you can't hear me, I will hold it closer to my face, I guess. Uh, anyway, so I'm Matt Margolis. I am an application development manager with Getty Images. We're about a mile uh, east of here. I have no idea which direction is east. <laughs> that way. Okay, I'll trust Brad. Uh, and I'm Mr. Margolis on social things, if you want to follow me or hear about my, my life stuff, things. Uh, and we're going to talk about automating AWS with Ruby today. Uh, so what's the plan? So I want to start with an introduction to AWS. Uh, we're going to mix in some pro tips in there. Uh, just to get a sense of the room, how many people here have actually done anything with AWS before? Used it for play, used it for work? Awesome. Okay. So, I've got some really good stuff in here, hopefully, for those of you that are kind of new to it. I've also got some stuff in here that I think will be uh, pretty valuable for folks that have it in production or that are thinking of using AWS in production. So after that, we're going to look at Fog, which is a Ruby gem that kind of helps with some of this automation. Uh, then we're going to look at using Fog plus CloudFormation. We'll go into more detail on that, but I am seriously in love with CloudFormation, and I hope you will uh, like it too. Uh, then we'll talk about some cloud pitfalls. These are going to be some, some kind of general topics that you're going to want to know about if you're thinking about using AWS for anything. And then we'll take questions. I'll take questions kind of whenever, if people want to ask during the presentation. If there are too many of them, then I'll push them to the end. So AWS in 10-ish minutes. Uh, so Amazon Web Services, uh, it's a cloud. So we've all heard about clouds. There are commercials about clouds that have nothing to do with computing. I don't really know what they're talking about some of the time. But this cloud uh, is a bunch of what are called regions around the world. And this is a map. Hopefully, you can see it either up there or over here. Um, and these yellow dots on the map, there's uh, four in the United States, one in South America. These are the locations where Amazon Web Services has a presence. Um, so the, the main ones that people in the United States tend to use, we've got one in Virginia, one in Portland, uh, there's one in Northern California, and then there's this special government one that I know nothing about. <laughs> so within each region, we've got what are called availability zones. And the way to think about these is they're really just data centers. So it's a, it's a data center within a region, and there tends to be like three of them. Uh, and they are separate data centers. So the idea is that if one of them was to blow up, the other two should still be up and working. Uh, but in practice, it's not always that nice. There are certain things that are not totally independent, and sometimes entire regions go down. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. So Amazon Web Services, services, I did that thing where you have like ATM machine. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole lot of services, right? So I'm not going to count them. But I've, I've used about a third of these in production, and I've played around with several others. So if there are any questions about specific services that we don't cover during the main part of the talk, come talk to me afterwards. So we're going to be focusing on using Amazon Web Services through their API. You can also use Amazon Web Services by going to a website. They have this, uh, this web console where you can sign in and it's very you know, point and click, and there's lots of uh, stuff you can do in there. I really don't like it. It is slow in Firefox, which is the browser I use. It works great in Chrome. Uh, so we won't go into that today. We're going to do everything through the API, because this talk is about automation. Uh, and the thing to know when you're using the Amazon Web Services API, like a lot of APIs, you need to authenticate, and you need to be authorized to do certain things. So when you're using uh, Amazon Web Services, you're going to have something called an access key and a secret key. You don't really need to worry about that for now. Just know that you're passing credentials to Amazon whenever you make an API call. Um, there's really great documentation on there about setting up uh, access keys. And when you're doing that, you want to have access keys that have very fine-grained permissions. Uh, this is kind of a, a thing to keep in mind if you, if you start exploring Amazon Web Services. You don't want to have keys that can just destroy everything uh, willy-nilly, because you will probably typo something at some point and destroy everything not so willy-nilly. Uh, so an example of kind of setting up permissions, you might have a deployment script. Uh, I have a deployment script. You might too. Uh, and you might want it to be able to spin up EC2 instances, which we'll talk about in a little bit. 
and write to storage, but you might not want it to be able to you know, delete all your DNS records or destroy all your data, because uh, you'll probably do it by accident, and that's not so good. Uh, when you're configuring these things, go and look for the AWS Policy Wizard. Uh, it's in that web console that I'm not going to show you today. Uh, and the reason why I really recommend using it is because it, it lets you sort of go through and say, I want to use uh, these five services with this set of keys. And you can get very granular about what exact API calls those keys are allowed to make. So go check it out. Um, if we have time, maybe I'll walk through that. So now for some gateway drugs. I want to talk about the, the Amazon Web Services components that most people use, kind of the, the starter set, or really what most people need. I'd say 80% of all applications just need these couple of services. And then if you have specific kind of scientific computing or big data problems, you might branch out from here. So the first is EC2, or Elastic Compute Cloud. And EC2 is the compute part of cloud computing on Amazon Web Services. So if you want to have a bunch of servers in the cloud, you're going to use EC2. And they're virtual machines. It's not like you have a, uh, a machine in an Amazon data center that's yours and only yours. These are all sort of uh, ephemeral, temporary uh, compute resources that are out there. You can use them and then stop using them and throw away. Someone else can use those resources. Uh, and you sort of pay for what you need. So if you need a really uh, large amount of RAM, you can get uh, an instance with a lot of RAM. If you need a lot of CPU, you can get an instance with a lot of CPU. Um, so next up, load balancing. So if you have more than one server, uh, if you have experience with you know, a production environment where you've got two or three servers, you probably have seen a load balancer before. This is just like what you're used to, except that it's a service. Uh, and one of the really interesting things about Elastic Load Balancers is that they're elastic. So what you can do is you can tell Amazon, you can say, I want to have, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but I want to have, uh, you know, a minimum of two servers and a maximum of four servers. And you can tell Amazon rules to look at to say when you want more compute. And Amazon will automatically spin up more servers. And they'll all just kind of appear in this load balancer and your traffic will go to those instances. So that's pretty neat. And really one of the primary reasons that people use Amazon Web Services is that elastic compute, the ability to say, I have by default five servers, but during Football season, my traffic triples for some reason because I have a football website. So during that time, I want to automatically scale up to be able to serve more traffic. Uh, and the pro tip on here, the, the thing to keep in mind, with Amazon Web Services, if you have, let's say you have a pretty small app, and you just need one server to serve the traffic, you should still use an elastic load balancer. Because what you can do is you can tell Amazon, I want a load balancer, and I want it to always have one instance behind it. And what Amazon will do if you do that is when that instance explodes or goes away for some reason, Amazon will automatically create one instance to take its place. So this is kind of like free uptime from Amazon. If your server explodes for some reason, starts failing health checks, you know, disk fills up or whatever, Amazon will just start up a new instance. So this is uh, another slide of what we were just talking about. The auto scaling is what it's called. Uh, so kind of piecing things together here, looking at the, the concepts we talked about thus far. You've got your cloud, kind of the thing on the outside. Uh, then you've got your region, which might be the AWS uh, US West 2 region in Portland, Oregon. Uh, then you've got an availability zone inside of that. And you've got a load balancer. And then you've got your auto scaling group. Here I've got four EC2 compute instances inside of there and the rules that I have in place. Uh, I want to increase the number of instances when I have over 100 requests in five minutes, and I want to decrease when I am using less than 50% of the CPU across that cluster. So you can really get pretty sophisticated here, and you can kind of make your sort of domain or business rules drive the amount of resources that you're using. So Simple Storage Service, S3, uh, it's storage practically unlimited. Uh, if you're storing terabytes and terabytes, it will cost you a lot of money. A uh, couple of tips about using S3. Uh, if you are wanting to download something from S3, 
Amazon will actually cap the rate at which you can download. You'll get a couple megs. But if you spin up another worker, another thread, and you can do this, we'll show uh, Fog is, is pretty good at this, you can actually start pulling down a lot more data. So you can spin up five downloads, and let's say you have a, a 20 meg pipe. You'll be able to use pretty much that whole pipe. But if you just had one, uh, if you just tried to download a file in your browser, one worker, you might get five megs. So that's something to keep in mind if you have a you know, need to download a lot. S3 also supports BitTorrent by default. So if you put something on S3, you can just download it with BitTorrent, which is kind of neat. Uh, and then kind of the opposite of that, when you're uploading something, you want to keep in mind uh, that when you're uploading from an EC2 instance, so when you have a, a compute resource in the cloud, the size of that instance, which normally equates to how much you're paying for it, uh, is what determines your upload speed. And Amazon doesn't really publish these numbers, but you can go looking and people have done all kinds of benchmarks. And the more expensive instances have faster upload. So if you, if you have like a, a website where users are uploading pictures of cats, and they're really big pictures and you need to get them onto S3, uh, you may want to look into uh, either uploading directly to S3, which uh, is something I can talk about later, or uh, having the upload go to your EC2 instance using something like you know, Paperclip, uh, and then having it go to S3, but you might want to use a larger instance so that you have a faster upload. Uh, and then relational database service, this is uh, kind of a core piece if you're planning to deploy a Ruby on Rails app on AWS. This is your MySQL, or your Oracle, or your SQL Server. Uh, I've only used MySQL. It's free after you pay the hour, hourly cost to Amazon. The other two, uh, they cost more on top of that because there's licenses involved. So it's actually really nice because it's not the same as running your own MySQL. This is, a, this is MySQL as a service. So you don't have to worry about all the updates and backups and things like that. You sort of just tell Amazon what you want and they make it happen. Uh, so if you're kind of getting into app dev and you're excited to, to work with Rails apps, but you're not a MySQL guru. In some ways, this is simpler. In some ways, it's harder. Um, one of the really cool things that Amazon has is uh, multi-availability zone for uh, RDS instances. So they will actually set up a, uh, a hot backup for you. So if your database ever does go down, you can automatically fail over to another database that's completely up to date with your master database. A quick question on multi availability zone. So, I haven't used it, but I'm, I'm trying to use it and I'm trying to understand. Does that mean you are paying for two instances at the same time? Mm -hmm. You are, okay. Yeah, so uh, my last point here, right? So, RDS can easily be 50% plus of your cost for running a small app on, on Amazon. And if you're using multiple availability zones, uh, it definitely can be. Uh, the idea, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, if you use multiple availability zones, and remember, those are like data centers. If one of the data centers explodes, you still have your, your app running in the other data center. But that means that you're paying full time for two data centers worth of, of resources. Uh, that can be good if you're trying to scale up your app. Like, I, I have you know four EC2 instances, two in each availability zone, all the time, and that's okay because I want four instances. Uh, but if I only needed one to be in multiple availability zones, I'd have to pay for another one that I might not need. Uh, and then just the, the caution here, when a lot of people hear about these costs, uh, or you know, hear that it's not the same as having MySQL that you can shell into and, and do whatever you want with, that it's a little bit different, it's a service. Um, people start thinking about rolling their own database. And we're gonna talk about this a bit more later, uh, but things blow up in the cloud. I, I think I've said that a couple times now. They just go away. Like, it, it's not yours, you don't get to keep it, it's Amazon's. If they want it back, they, they just take it. Um, fortunately, you can have things in place that automatically make a new one. But if you roll your own database, that means that you're running like MySQL on an EC2 instance. And if that instance explodes, you better know what you're doing because otherwise your database just went away. And even if you can recover it, it may not have shut down cleanly and all kinds of you know, not so good things can happen to your data. Uh, 
You also want to be careful if you're using RDS when you're fiddling around in the web UI or when you're using the API with Fog or, or anything else. Because there are certain settings that if you change them, Amazon interprets that as it being okay to destroy the database and make a new one. Uh, that's pretty much never okay. <laughs> you, you really don't want that unless you have a really good backup and you've got downtime pages up or something like that. Uh, and then kind of the last sort of uh, core Amazon service I want to talk about is virtual private cloud. And this is a feature that not everyone that uses AWS really knows about, but it's one that I consider to be pretty much essential. Uh, so what VPC is, is it's basically your own private network inside of Amazon's network. So normally when you, when you are in the cloud, you've got boxes kind of all over the place, they're floating around in the cloud, whatever, right? And they could be right next to someone else's. There, there's no real network security around things. You're, you're totally out in the open. You've got public DNS and public IPs on everything. Um, if there's another set of you know, Rails exploits or your Ubuntu uh, isn't totally up to date and you've got security issues, people can just scan public IPs, find your box, hack you. It's not so good. Uh, so what a VPC does is it lets you create these little networks. I'm actually kind of show. I don't know if you can see this too well. but uh, So this, this blue box here is a VPC. And within that, you carve out these little subnetworks. And I've got, in this case, two public subnets and two private subnets. And what this lets you do is create what's called a layered architecture, right? Where you can have uh, your load balancer in the public subnet. The load balancer has a public IP. It has public DNS. You can go to www.myawesomecloud.com and you hit that load balancer. But the stuff down below, my database, my Rails application cluster, those are completely unreachable from the public internet. They don't have public IPs. They have IPs like 10.0.0.5. You can't hit that. Uh, which means that you have quite a bit of additional security. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better. Uh, it also means that you can have very clear restrictions on what systems can talk to what systems. I can have several more subnets in here and maybe I'm working for the government, or maybe I'm working in pharmaceuticals or some other you know, legal industry. There may be laws about having separation between resources, and this is how you can do that on Amazon Web Services. They do have specific uh, stuff on top of this for government and, and uh, HIPAA compliance and things like that. But this is how you would sort of do like the first pass of that. Um, and you can see here, this is an illustration showing the uh, multi-availability zone for MySQL where I have this MySQL here, which is my master, my, my primary MySQL. And that's in uh, West 2B, which is an availability zone. So it's in the West 2B data center. If this was to go away, if something was to happen catastrophically at Amazon, this West 2A uh, would still be around, hopefully. And Amazon would automatically make this my, my new uh, MySQL. Sorry, I'm not. Mics are hard. Uh, and then lastly, so there's a, a DNS service that Amazon offers. This is really cool. Uh, I will kind of gush about this in more detail later if anyone's curious. But the, the really cool part here is when you do a deployment uh, to Amazon, one of the big things to think about is you're not deploying to your production server. That's not how you should do things. You deploy to a new production server every time. Because the old one... It's still there, but you can have a new one for really cheap. For 13 cents an hour, you can have a new one for an hour to verify the new one, turn off the old one. You pay an extra 13 cents to have an hour to verify your application in production while still having your, your application live, the previous version of it. That's really a big deal. Um, and Route 53 is one way that you can make that really easy. So when I do a deployment, I can create an entirely new production server and I can point you know, offline.myawesomeapp at that new server. Well, www.myawesomeapp is at my old server. I can do all the proofing I want at, at the offline server, and when I'm ready, I can make an API call. I can just you know, go run a shell script, and it will repoint www.myawesomeapp at the new production. That's really cool. So, that's kind of the, the, the quick intro to Amazon Web Services. Uh, now we're going to get into more of the automation piece. And the, the tool that I want to talk about for automation is called Fog. And Fog is the uh, self 
proclaimed Ruby Cloud Services Library. Uh, so Fog is not Amazon specific. It's actually uh, very not Amazon specific. It's very cloud agnostic. It supports some giant list of different providers, Rackspace, Linode, VMware, vSphere, I don't know other clouds off the top of my head, but there are many of them. Uh, and so here's an example of using Fog. Um, is that big enough to read, hopefully? Yeah. Up there? Okay. So what this example is doing is this is using uh, Amazon S3, that storage service that we talked about before. And oh, I can't see my mouse. Okay. So up here, we're going to start off by uh, just initializing a new fog storage object. And you can see here, I actually have to pass in my provider is Amazon Web Services because fog is not AWS specific. So this same code, pretty much, could work with another provider if I just pass in a different provider name there. It's kind of cool. You're not really uh, tied to Amazon. You know, if you use something Amazon specific, you will be, but if you kind of stick to the sort of normal cloud stuff, then you won't be. Uh, then I'm going to pass in those keys that I was talking about before that you should probably lock down to be pretty specific to talking to S3. Uh, I've got a file on disk, uh, user content images, photo on.png. It's, you know, somebody uploaded a picture of a cat. And I'm going to go and I'm going to get uh, the bucket called my bucket. S3, you store everything in, in what's called buckets. So you, you can create these uh, ahead of time. You I think you're limited on the number that you can have, and they have to be unique, which is kind of a pain. Uh, so it's sort of like you know Twitter handles. You know, if you if you really want a specific S3 bucket, go get it now. Uh, and then you're going to go ahead and you're going to uh, create a file inside of that bucket. Bucket files create. You're going to pass in the key, which you can think of as the identifier for this file. Um, it looks like a like a directory path a lot of the time, but uh, that's just the convenience. Amazon doesn't actually store things in directories, really. Uh, the body is going to be the, the contents of the file, and then S3 supports both public and private files. So if something is public, I can just give you the S3 URL and you can go download it, which is kind of nice. If you want to store all your site's images on there, or uh, you know, if you've got a bunch of recipes you just want to share with anyone who wants to, to read them, you can just send around that link. But for a lot of use cases, you're going to want to kind of lock it down. You know, you may not want to let anyone uh, pull down, you know, your user's profile pictures. Maybe those are, are not public content. So you can set it to be false uh, for public. And then what you're going to need is a, is a secure URL. And that's just the same URL that would be public, but with a, an extra param that's this big, long secret key thing. Uh, so then for getting that big, long private URL, I can call bucket.files.getHttpS URL and pass in the file name and an expiration, which is really cool because these, these uh, URLs can expire. So you can say, for the next five minutes, anyone that goes to this link can download my ebook. I'm having a sale. It's free. Go ahead. Uh, but in five minutes, the link will stop working. Kind of neat. So that's uh, kind of an example of... Uh, really whatever use of fog looks like. You go ahead and you, you make the uh, service object, the fog storage or the fog compute or the fog DNS. You pass in your credentials, then you go ahead and you do what you need to do with that object to change resources on Amazon. So like I said, fog supports a lot of different providers, which is really great in theory, but if you just want to use Amazon or if you just want to use Rackspace, it can actually be a little tricky because the docs uh, the high-level docs are kind of generic. They're trying not to be just like an AWS primer. Uh, so what I recommend doing uh, is going into RDoc or going to GitHub and looking just at the AWS parts, if that's what you're using. If you're using some other cloud, go look at those other parts. Uh, there's also some really good tutorials online if you just go and search for you know, FOG, AWS Compute, or FOG, AWS Storage, whatever you want to. So uh, for those of you who want to go check out this stuff on GitHub, uh, if you go to the fog, fog repo, uh, and then you go into lib fog AWS, that's going to bring you to all the AWS specific bits. 
So these files are actually pretty well documented. They will often just refer you to go look at the actual official AWS docs to see what all the parameters are, which is kind of a bummer. But uh, between this and the Amazon docs, uh, most of the calls are pretty self-explanatory. And again, if they're not, you know, there's pretty good Google resources for, for this stuff. Or, you know, ask, you know, tweet me, whatever. So now we get to another really interesting tool for automation, which is cloud formation, which is my absolute favorite thing about Amazon Web Services. Uh, this has pretty much fundamentally changed the way that I think about developing for the cloud. And the way to think about cloud formation is that it's a lot like Puppet or Chef. You know? So those are tools where you have a server and you say that this is an application server for this certain app. And that means that I want to install these packages on it and I want to make sure that it has this host file and these firewall rules and all that stuff. And it's declarative and it just makes it happen. You know? CloudFormation is like that, but it's for your entire infrastructure, which is really neat. Uh, as a developer or someone who has worked as a developer, I've often found that you know, code and, and data are really easy to think about and work with. And things that are sort of configured or, or one-offs are a lot harder to reason about. You know? So if you've got a, a data center and you went and you configured a couple servers and you taught them how to talk to each other and you've got some storage going on in a database, that's all great. But if you ever need to recreate that, how long is it going to take you? you know, if you have a VPS and you have one server, you probably can snapshot it or you can use Puppet or Chef. But if you've got like five servers and you want to, you know, move to another provider or you want to uh, create another set of those five servers if they go away for some reason, that's going to be a lot of work. On Amazon Web Services, CloudFormation can pretty much do all that for you. So CloudFormation templates are just JSON, which is really cool. Uh, I'm really glad that they're not XML. I was kind of worried at first when I heard about this because Amazon has a lot of services that used to be SOAP, but they've now moved to, uh, to JSON for pretty much everything, which is great. Uh, and when your infrastructure is data, it is really, really transformative, like I was saying. You can start in Git, uh, so if you need to version it or go back and find out, you know, hey, what do we do that broke the database config? It's right there. Uh, you can test it, you know, so you can use Ruby to take this big JSON blob and parse it into a hash, and you can write RSpec against it. You can make sure that you've got the right number of servers and that your auto-scaling rules are what you think they are. Um, that's really neat. And then it's also making it a lot easier to have collaboration between developers and operations, right? So if you're on a bigger team or if you have a, a buddy who's a sysadmin or something and you want to collaborate on your infrastructure, this gives you a way to pass something back and forth and not just, you know, send them an email saying, hey, I set up the firewall rules today. But you can actually say, like, here's a description of the firewall rules. If you need to tweak them, tweak them and give this back to me and then it will happen. Uh, and finally, CloudFormation can be your deployment script. And this is getting back to what I was talking about before with when you deploy into AWS, don't think about deploying to your production server. Think about deploying a new production server. And then you're going to turn off the old one when you're done with it. With CloudFormation, you can deploy a new one of everything if you want. You know, if, if you want a new database every time you deploy, I, I don't really recommend it because it's confusing, but you could do that. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a CloudFormation script that has 100 resources in it, and every time you deploy, you want to create a, a fresh 100 resources for a couple minutes, because otherwise that'll start to get costly, you can go ahead and do that really easily. And we're going to talk about how to do that. So Amazon provides a whole bunch of resources, uh, example of CloudFormation templates. Let's kind of zoom this a bit, see if we can make it legible. So at the top here, they've got a bunch of uh, Microsoft Windows server samples. I'm going to skip those, because I don't know anything about that. Uh, but down here, they've got open source applications. So let's say that you want to play around with Drupal, or you want to play around with Redline, is a Ruby project management tool that a lot of people use, or Trax, or WordPress. You can go to Amazon Web Services, to the CloudFormation templates, and you can go ahead and, and look at these, and we're going to pull one up in a second. They've also got a button next to it to just launch a stack. So if you have an AWS account, and you're signed in, you can just go here, you can read what one of these is going to do, Go ahead and click this button, and in a couple minutes, you'll have a just a WordPress in the cloud that you can go and start messing with. Um, you probably don't want to use one of these base templates in production, but it's a really great way to learn. And 
when I've used uh, cloud information in production, it's often been by going and looking at these and sort of piecing together the ones I want. You know, this one has a database, and this one's in multiple availability zones, and this one has S3 stuff going on. You know, you can kind of fit them together and end up with something really cool. So we're going to go uh, a little bit down here, and we're going to look at a simple Ruby on Rails Hello World application in the cloud. So let's go with a uh, single EC2 instance with an Amazon RDS database. So this is going to be a Rails app running on one EC2 instance, and there's going to be an RDS MySQL database off to the side that it can talk to. Is that good size? So, like I said, CloudFormation templates are just JSON. So, if you're familiar with JSON, uh, they will still be scary just because there's a lot of stuff in here, but uh, hopefully they won't be too scary. So, Amazon's really nice, and they put a description up at the top of theirs. Uh, not everybody does that, but Amazon's really good at it. Uh, and then there's a couple different sections that you find in CloudFormation templates. So, the first one is parameters. And this is really neat. If you think about it, a JSON template is a static file. There's no real logic in JSON. There, you know, it's not Ruby, it's not uh, a JavaScript file, it's just JSON, it's a data structure. But by declaring parameters, you can tell Amazon that I'm going to create this CloudFormation stack, and I'm gonna tell you a couple of things in particular that I want you to keep in mind when you're ex executing this template. And that's where the parameters come into play. So, for example, uh, the database name, the database username, how much storage you want in your database. These are all parameters. If you think about executing a cloud formation template, like calling a function or a method, uh, these are the arguments to that method. So this is all parameters. Like I said, they're kind of verbose templates, but they're still uh, the nicest representation of infrastructure as data that I've ever seen. Uh, then there's mappings. Don't worry too much about these. This is where you can specify you know, sort of uh, decisions based on where you are or what kind of instance you want. So, like this, this down here, right, is saying if I'm in the US East 1 data center region, uh, availability zone, or yeah, availability zone, uh, then I want to use this virtual machine image, this AMI. If I'm in the US West 2 data center, I want to use this AMI. And that's because a lot of these things like AMIs um, and S3 buckets are specific to a, a region. So when you create a virtual machine, if you have like a favorite Ubuntu Rails image that you use everywhere, if you upload that to the West Coast and you upload it to the East Coast, you might end up with a different AMI ID. Uh, so these mappings sort of let you say that in the West Coast, use this one, in the East Coast, use that one. It's probably the same thing, so it should be okay. The most interesting part here is the resources. This is where we actually tell Amazon what we want, what we want them to make, and how we want them to make it. So, uh, like the description of this template said, this is going to create one EC2 instance and one RDS MySQL database. So, this top part here uh, is named web server, and you can call this whatever you want, and it is of type AWS EC2 instance. So that means that this is our EC2 instance declaration. And there's an awful lot of parameters that you can pass in here. Uh, AWS has really great cloud formation docs if you go check it out. Uh, by really great, I mean they're really big and anything you could want to know is in there, but sometimes it can be hard to find, so plan to spend a little time digging. Uh, so there's this part here, AWS cloud formation init. This is kind of like a, an initialization script section. So when your EC2 instance starts up, what do you want to actually happen? Uh, and Amazon has some nice understanding of certain things, so we can say, let's go install some packages using yum, let's install some Ruby gems, uh, let's go and grab uh, this S3 file, we're going to put it in home EC2 user sample, and then we're going to go and we're going to spit out a file, which is going to be our database.yaml. The reason this is in here, uh, as opposed to being in the code base, is that some of these things can't be known before you create the database, right? When you create something on AWS, you get pretty much random DNS and a random IP. Uh, if you're inside of a VPC, you can set some constraints on the IP range, but 
If you're not, then you're going to get whatever Amazon wants to give you, whatever they have free. So things like the endpoint of the database, you can't know ahead of time. So you can't just have a database.yaml in your Rails app that says go talk to this database in production because it might not be there. Uh, if you set up DNS uh, or use an elastic IP, then you can. But in the base case where we're just sort of saying create these two things at the same time, you need to create the database first, find out where it is, and then tell that to the Rails app. So then there's a whole bunch of stuff down here. This is another section, uh, user data, where once the instance starts up, you can do some stuff. And this is how they're installing Rails. Don't worry too much about this. It's kind of a mess. But you can see that they're bundle installing. They're running rake db migrate, um, setting up some uh, stuff. Yes. Uh, so that's kind of a, a simple case of a, a cloud formation template. Down here we have the database, the actual creation of the RDS instance. So, you know, type RDS DB instance. We're going to pass in parameters again. The database name was a parameter, username, password, all that stuff. And then, so that's the end of the resources section. And the final section in the CloudFormation template is the outputs. So this is really neat because if you create a CloudFormation template, you have the opportunity to pass parameters in, but you can also get stuff out. So let's say that I want to create a database in the cloud, and I want to know the address that it was created at so that I can give it to a friend to go start debbing our, our startup idea against, right? I can set an output of the, uh, in this case, they did the, the public DNS of the web server. So this would be where you would go to actually see the Rails application that it installed up above. But you could just as easily say, you know, get adder of the MySQL database uh, endpoint. Actually do that uh, up here. Right, so if you just took this code here, it's my SQL database endpoint address, and put it down there, then when you run the CloudFormation script and it's done, it would spit out the address of your database. Okay. Any general questions about CloudFormation stuff? I, I know it's kind of a lot. It's a, a very verbose syntax, but it's also really, really powerful. Okay. So combining what we've talked about so far, you can take a CloudFormation template and you can pass it to Fog, and Fog will tell Amazon, go make these resources, or go update these resources, or go destroy these resources. So kind of the same pattern as before. You create a Fog AWS CloudFormation object. Tell it what region, pass in your access key ID and your secret access key. And then once you've got that object authenticated, you can go ahead and you can make API calls with it. So down here we call uh, CloudFormation create stack you name your stack so that when you go into the web UI, you can see a list of all the CloudFormations you have running and you can differentiate them. And you pass in as an argument to that the template body, which is just your JSON string. So you can store the, the JSON in a file, uh, which is really neat because then you can take a, take a play from the asset pipeline in Rails and you can actually have like a Haml file that's there. Uh, you know, some other format that spits out a JSON file. So you can have some dynamic bits in there. Um, and then finally, you know, with CloudFormation, one of the most uh, life-changing, if you're using this stuff, one of the most life-changing things is that it creates, destroys, and updates your stack as a, as a unit, right? So if you were using just fog without CloudFormation, and you create 50 EC2 instances, you have to keep track of all of those. You have to go and hunt them down and, and turn them off. Uh, it can be kind of a hassle, especially if you've got multiple people using the same account, and you might turn off one of their instances by mistake. But with CloudFormation, you could create those 50 EC2 instances, and then tell Amazon, destroy this stack. And that's just a CF dot, I think, destroy stack. You pass in the stack name. And it just turns them all off at the same time, pretty much. They just, they're gone, right? So this is how I like to think about deploying to the cloud. I have a CloudFormation stack that, des that uh, describes my application. I give it to Fog. I get an entirely new version of my application. And then I go and I destroy the old stack that I was previously running in production. 
This also gives you really great rollback opportunities because you can leave both stacks running and just point DNS at the new version. And if you get a call from your, your customer that you know you broke <coughs> checkout or you know the, they don't like the button color or something, you can just flip it back to the previous build really easily. It's very fast. So now I want to talk about some common pitfalls in the cloud. These are sort of things to keep in mind as you start to play with AWS. Uh, things that a lot of startups and a lot of people just kind of playing around don't really want to worry about, but then they get really screwed over later on. So it's important if you're going to do anything in the cloud to sort of pay attention to these common pitfalls. So the first one is getting too attached. Uh, like we've talked about before, cloud resources can just go away. They're like farm animals. You don't want to to name them and, and, and you know wake up in the morning and wish your EC2 instance a happy day. It's just not, you're, you're setting yourself up to be really sad. Uh, I like to think of EC2 instances kind of like water bottles. You know, you use it and you recycle it when you're done with it. Maybe you use it for a little while, you refill it a couple times, that's cool, but eventually it's gonna go away. Amazon is not going to let you have an EC2 instance with like three years uptime. At some point it's just gonna explode, it's gonna be gone, you better not need it. Uh, if there was something on it, you're kind of out of luck unless you've got it backed up. And then storage uh, is also one of those things that you don't want to get too attached to unless it's the right kind of storage. EC2 instances, you have a choice. You can use what's called an ephemeral disk, which is a hard drive, could be 80 gigs, 200 gigs, 400 gigs. But when that instance is gone, all that data is destroyed. It's just not there anymore. You cannot recover it. So if you're storing really important stuff on an ephemeral drive and Amazon decides, hey, you know what, that EC2 instance, I need that for something, and it's gone, then you've just lost all of that data. Uh, the alternative is you can use what's called an elastic block store drive, EBS, which is kind of a slow network drive compared to the ephemeral disk. The ephemeral disk is really fast, but it doesn't stick around. EBS drive, is a lot slower, but you have some more assurances that when the instance goes away, as long as you don't also destroy that disk, you can probably get that data. So it's a trade-off of performance. Uh, it's worth noting that when Amazon does have problems, EBS is one of those services that tends to have more problems. Uh, so if you are using EBS, you're kind of asking for a world of hurt. Uh, Turns out that a lot of Amazon's own services also use EBS under the covers, so when that goes south, a lot of things just stop working. Uh, and then like I said, don't store anything valuable on EC2. If you have something that you need, if, if there's user data that is you know, sacred and has to live forever, or even for more than a second, put it on S3, put it in your database, put it in another service somewhere that has you know, durability guarantees around that data. Uh, we kind of alluded to this one, so not expecting downtime. A lot of people, they go in the cloud, they say, hey, I've got this whole you know, Portland region, I can spin up all the instances I want, they're great, Amazon really takes care of it for me, I don't have to worry about all the details, and then Portland blows up or something, right? Uh, so you really need to plan for this if your application needs to be up. If you're, if you're just playing around, don't worry about it, have fun, it's a lot easier and cheaper just to have one instance. But I would say for anything that's making money or anything that you think is important, you should really consider using multiple availability zones. So if I'm in Portland, I'm going to at least be in US West 2A and US West 2B, maybe US West 2C. Those are all separate data centers. The problem there that we talked about before is now you're really increasing your costs. So that 13 cents an hour all of a sudden becomes you know, 33 cents an hour or 39 cents an hour, whatever. And that can really add up very quickly, especially if you're using larger instances, which are maybe dollars an hour, and you leave them on full time. That, that's a lot of money. Uh, and then beyond that, if you really have like a mission critical app, like if you are, you know, writing cloud software for the Mars rover or something, I don't know, uh, you should probably use multiple regions. And so this would be deploying your app on the West Coast, deploying your app on the East Coast, maybe in South America, in the UK, in Australia, Singapore, uh, the different regions around the world where AWS has a presence. The difficulty there is that 
most of the Amazon services are fairly easy to use in a multi-availability zone way. They will support, just in the API, you say, I want this to be in multiple availability zones, and Amazon will make it happen. You don't really have to change anything about your application. But when you start talking about multiple regions, now you've got problems, because the Amazon services are really regional. Uh, if I have a database on the West Coast, nothing from Amazon will automatically synchronize that with the database on the East Coast. Amazon will synchronize it within the West Coast, but I can have a backup, but I can't you know, if a user signs up on the West Coast, my East Coast data center is not going to know about it unless I go out of my way to re-architect my app to have some sort of like message bus or something that's sending data to the East Coast to synchronize or if I'm sharding my users and sending, you know, the users from the East Coast to the East Coast to the West Coast to the West Coast, but then you're still screwed if things go down because now half of your users' data is gone. So this is probably the hardest, like the single most difficult problem to solve with cloud deployments. But it's also probably the single most difficult problem to solve with any application that you want to deploy in two data centers, whether or not those data centers are in the cloud. So keep that in mind. Most applications you know, don't need multiple regions out of the gate. But if you have something that is your livelihood, you should really consider it. Not having a backup plan. So when AWS experiences an outage, or it gets slow, or you know, something goes wrong, you want to have a plan. And if that plan is that you've got multiple regions and that downtime isn't going to hurt you, that's great. But if that isn't your plan, you should definitely have like a downtime page or some way to put up a status page. You don't want your users to just think that your site, you know, went away or is just buggy and not working, right? So there's a couple different ways you can do this. Uh, you can actually put up an HTML page, JavaScript, CSS, up on S3 in the Amazon storage, and you can point DNS at that. And this uh, link shows you how to walk through that. And, and then you, know, you flip DNS and you've got a downtime page up. It's really neat. Alternatively, you can create a machine image for an EC2 instance that is your downtime page. And this could be a dynamic downtime page, right? You could have a Rails app that's your downtime page and picks a random funny you know, YouTube video to show people when the site's down. So you create that AMI, you want to do this ahead of time so that you have it when things are exploding because you're going to be on the phone with people talking about how terrible things are, not wanting to create this right then and there. Uh, so then if something happens, you can go ahead and deploy this to a different region. So if the West Coast is having a problem, you want to have this, this machine image available in a couple of different regions so that you can pick one that's you know, still up and that isn't experiencing like a crazy mad rush from everyone that was over on the West Coast to get over to the East Coast. You want to maybe pick the UK or something that people aren't going to jump to as their first choice and spin up that downtime instance there, point your DNS at it, and you're good to go, at least until Amazon comes back up. Uh, and then another kind of pitfall related to security, I, I've talked a couple times about having really special care for your, your authorization keys for the API, making sure that they're not too widely powerful, that you can't just destroy the entire world accidentally. Um, you also want to make sure that you're handling them securely, that you're not giving them out to people that you don't trust, or that you're, uh, you know, maybe your business partner and you both have them and then you get in a fight and one of you, you know, has a bad night and, and destroys the database. That's not so good. So when possible, you want to avoid storing your, your API keys uh, on an EC2 instance or in Git. Uh, storing credentials in Git in general is kind of a no-no if you can avoid it. So Amazon actually gives you an out here. They have a service built into AWS that makes this a lot easier than it used to be. This is actually something new in the last year, I think, where you can, when you're creating an EC2 instance, and you can do this in a CloudFormation template, you can specify a role you can say this EC2 instance has the role of you know, upload handler. And then elsewhere in the Amazon API, you can describe upload handler means it can write to S3 for these specific buckets. It can't delete from S3. It can't talk to the database. It can't make new instances. It can't change DNS. It can't do anything else. All it can do is put files in my cat's bucket on S3. And Whenever that instance needs credentials, you can use fog, or you can actually do this pretty easily even without fog, just by uh, doing a get against a URL on the instance. 
uh, you can go make this call and you will get back temporary credentials from Amazon that rotate on a regular basis. So what this lets you do is have that EC2 instance get short-lived access to write to S3 without having keys on there that, you know, let's say you get hacked and somebody sneaks on there and you don't know about it and they get those keys and then a week later they go and they start uploading pictures of dogs and you're like, what the hell's going on? All my pictures of cats are gone, it's all dogs, this is terrible. Uh, everybody stop using the site. That's sad. Uh, so by having these keys use roles, they rotate. So if somebody did get on your server and did steal a key, it would only be good for a couple of hours. And then they wouldn't be able to do anything. So at least you have some protection there. So I really do recommend if you're using AWS in production, uh, consider using uh, the roles. It's not that hard, and it will make you sleep much better at night. So any questions? Anything related to the cloud, Amazon? Yes. What is like, what's the cost to kind of get 